Hi, good evening. My name is Annika. I'm wearing a funny cap with a goat on it. And um, I'm going to uh, go live with Ellis Bucknell, who wrote the essays on the text about the artists for this catalog titled Friends and Friends of Friends, Artistic Communities in the Age of Social Media. <clears throat> so let's see if Alice is here. There she is. Hi, Oli. This is the catalog. <clears throat> okay, there she is. Hey, hey. what are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm wearing a cap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing a palm tree, sort of. <laughs> Very good. This is the catalogue we're going to speak about. Has it arrived yet in London? No, it is not yet. Oh, no. Any day now, I think. <laughs> okay. I know uh, Dale, it reached Dale, so, I mean, it can't be that far away. Yeah, I mean, I hope it arrives tomorrow, so. But, I mean, you've seen the PDF, so you know Got a PDF. That, it looks, that it looks beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, cool. So... You are in London, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Would you like to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, as you can probably tell from the accent, I am <laughs> from the United States. Um, I'm an artist and writer who has been living in London for the past five years now. Um, I am interested in the ways that technology influences our everyday lives um, and also like larger questions like it's ecological and environmental stakes. Um, I write primarily about artists that engage with technology uh, in my writing practice, but this was a super fun challenge and a super great experience writing about um, this collection of artists and this exhibition because as I think many of us have noticed in the contemporary art scene, painting has been taken in a really interesting direction in the past decade. Like it's, it's really kind of embraced the internet and, and pushed beyond um, post-internet aesthetics in like a really exciting way. Um, so yeah, that's my personal background and a bit of like why I was interested in um, this show and a bit about my ideas for the catalog, which no doubt we'll talk about more. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be doing this like live session with you. And what do you think, you've just mentioned that painting is very interesting, and what do you think, why are so many digital natives, let's call them digital natives, are interested in, <clears throat> in like producing or creating physical work again, like sculptures and paintings? I mean, what we've seen like Instagram exists since 2010, and then many artists mm -hmm. started, started doing like Amalia Ullman Instagram performances, mm -hmm. Maria Schrager, and then, many female artists got famous through advocating or, I mean, trying to find ways to present their work on Instagram and were facing censorship. So that was a big topic in the first place. Mm. And then at some point, artists started, started going back to a very traditional medium. What do you think? Why is that? Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting looking at the proliferation of more like performance based work around the birth of Instagram and other social media channels. Um, I think that very quickly artists like Amalia, you know, became very like intensely aware of the limitations of working um, on Instagram as a media. Um, I think that that was kind of the issue that a lot of post-internet artists had as well, which is like, if you're making work that like exists exclusively on a platform, uh, like what happens if the platform gets taken down or if the platform decides that you're violating its terms of conditions, um, like there's really, there's like a hierarchy embedded into a lot of the social media that we use. Um, so I think that the, the answer is twofold. I think that also for a lot of artists, like the artists in this exhibition who are children of the 80s and 90s, there's this kind of oversaturation point with digital immateriality. Um, there's a kind of ennui, I think, with working exclusively in an immaterial media that I think a lot of artists 
uh, especially artists who today deal with like um, social and political issues that are deeply personal, such as the artists in the show, there's a kind of return to tactility and a return to a physical studio practice and a reliance almost on the material qualities of artwork when everything else is so uncertain. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and I also had the feeling that, you know, in the beginning of Instagram, people try to figure out how to use the medium and if it's possible to use it as an artistic platform. And then once they understood how the platform works and, mm. you know, you, you can do performances and then people started doing AR filters, but, mm -hmm. you know, these things quickly get boring because at some point people understand, like with Amalia Ullmann, I mean, what she tried to prove for, was that everyone is a liar online. Mm -hmm. And at some point, people understood that, so. Yeah, I think the work, like, definitely runs the risk of being reductive or, like, being too one-to-one. -one. Or even, like, in, like, a Richard Prince sense, it's, like, super easy to just take the kind of aesthetics of Instagram at face value and just really not do anything, like, imaginative or creative or critical with it. It's literally just, like, regurgitating the format and that's it yeah so it's like instagram is like a computer game we're done now <laughs> <laughs> finished with the level so the next thing is going going let's yeah i mean going back to painting mm. and i think brandon lipchick he's he's also in the show and he said in an interview with me that when you live in a world where you're constantly bombarded by images at some point you you simply want something to hold on to Mm -hmm. And that is what, what painting is all about, one single image yeah. um, that only exists once. So, and what did you find out? I mean, you wrote the, let's show this beautiful catalog again, designed by um, Berlin-based design studio Yukiko, who can I can show this? Damn, it's thick. I didn't realize how thick it was. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. <laughs> beautiful. That's the back. I can show can show the inside a bit. Here's an interview with uh, uh, Andrea Amalai, Oli App, the artist, and um, Andrea Amalai, the curator, a uh, uh, London-based curator, shows some, that's your essay, shows the 19 artists in the show. And I invited you to write the texts about the artists. And let's show people one text really beautiful catalog mm -hmm. really beautiful <laughs> so what did you find out about the artists in the show yeah so um so yeah there's 19 artists in the exhibition um I, in my research looking at their practices uh both individually and as a whole i kind of noticed four main themes that ran throughout the show um and these themes are post-digital painting um Second one is black futurism. The third is a topic that I call misbehaving bodies. And the fourth is looking at ways in which the artists in the exhibition who are dealing primarily with the sculptural practice, how they're kind of reinventing the boundaries of sculpture and turning it on its head. Uh, the post-digital painting section is the one that you just mentioned, Brandon, Lipchick, Isabel, Ali, F, of course, Gina Beavers, and Austin Lee. Uh, the Black Futures in section is the sculptor and multidisciplinary artist, Shwanda Corbett, Cheyenne Julian, uh, Renee Matic, Devin Shimiyama. Uh, Misbehaving Bodies uh, is Dominic Fung, Sarah Slappy, Roxanne Jackson, Dale Lewis, and Spears. Sculpture is Harrison Pierce, Al Freeman, Nick Doyle, Daniel Bocato, Jabila Akwangu. Uh, so yeah, that was like just basically the Bila you've just mentioned, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and across all four categories, you'll notice um, a trend in a lot of the artist practices is to kind of borrow freely from our historical movements. Um, there's a tendency to sort of collage and combine various facets of different movements. Um, which I think is very kind of exemplary of this, the new direction that painting is heading in. It's almost like taking a Wikipedia style approach to art history. And I mean that in like, that's not at all. 
not at all to be like um, reductive or condescending, but actually just looking at the kind of vast amount of information that we have about the history of art that's available online 24 seven, no need to step into a gallery space, um, kind of acknowledging the way in which that information is so accessible and bountiful and maybe not getting too hung up in the art historical details, but rather using the aesthetics of let's say like romanticism or surrealism in the case of Dominique Fung and integrating it into their own work to critique uh, very contemporary issues of structural and systemic racism, anti-Asian racism, uh, the exotification of Asian female bodies um, and kind of creating a very contemporary and personal approach uh, using like stylistic devices that are familiar throughout art history. So yeah, that was a theme that I noticed a lot in, in the work, in the show. That's Austin Lee, for example. Mm -hmm. Can you say, say a little bit more about Austin maybe? Because I think he's yeah, the, sure. one, of, one of the artists in the show that started That, that is a big influence, I think, on or uh, that was or is still a big influence for so many of the artists in the show because he started like very early mm -hmm. doing these Photoshop kind of like um, paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like a super interesting facet of Austin's practice is the kind of like um, anti chronological approach to technology. Like in his work, he first uses uh, a VR headset to engage with um, painting as like a 3D exercise. So he's able to take his VR headset, his Oculus Rift, take his little hand controllers and skate around in virtual space, creating a, um, a composition in virtual reality. And then, uh, his next step is to basically translate that into 2D canvas. So um, whereas like a lot of artists, for instance, they see a kind of like, tele like teleological order or like a chronological order between like painting as this like fundamentally like old school media or something that's, um, you know, fundamentally like non-technological. And then they see like digital art as this like new dimension, like a next kind of like next level, let's say in art history he basically takes the opposite approach. So he goes from 3D or 4D even back to 2D and 3D. Um, so I think that that's like a super interesting style of working. I mean, there's artists like Rachel Rawson, who is New York based, does like a similar thing. Like this whole concept of painting in virtual reality is um, like a very fruitful, I think, approach to painting that really expands the boundaries of The, the medium, um, it kind of, you know, makes you understand that it's literally, it's not just like uh, reduced to like a white canvas in, in like a studio, um, like an anti-technological approach anymore. Like that, that idea of painting is like dead. <laughs> so yeah, this work is really awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Let me go back to <clears throat> Brandon Lipchick who has a very interesting um, so people were speaking about the catalog friends and friends of friends and we're speaking with Alice Buckman who wrote the text for the catalog and an essay this is a work by Brandon Lipchick and he works with an airbrush and his perspective is quite interesting mm -hmm. can you say a little bit more about this Yeah, sure. I mean, Brandon and I spoke a little bit before I wrote um, his text for the exhibition, and I was super interested in his work as um, as a writer who thinks a lot about architecture and built space, and specifically the kind of like the fallacy or the um, the kind of like uh, inherent fakeness, let's say, of like architectural renderings. Uh, specifically the perspective of architectural rendering um, in, you know, designed in AutoCAD or Rhino architectural software. They're always designed from a completely made up perspective. It's this weird cross between like, like three, three quarters perspective and like bird's eye view. But basically like when you're looking at a rendering of a building, 
you're never actually like it'll never look that way in real life because the architects are twisting and warping the perspective to make it look as good as possible uh in, in the kind of like commercial leaflets and the um the the illustrations outside of construction billboards around cities worldwide and brandon takes a really interesting approach to that kind of unreal perspective um it also engages with ideas of like surveillance culture and paranoia uh in the the text i wrote on him i refer to it as a kind of bird's eye view let's like it's it's something that's kind of hovering over um figures that are often located in like scenes of american suburbia like in the summer time lots of like pools and uh fights in the yard with hoses or like steamy outdoor showers there's a sense of intimacy in the work but also a sense of like kind of this like excruciating alienation between the figures um there's just a lot of like emotional layers baked into the work and i love how it engages with this sort of like hypernatural or surreal perspective that's just like not physically possible in real life i think that's really interesting it kind of like it like intensifies the idea or the feeling of his work as it's almost like dream space and i think we should also speak about the work of Oli Ab yeah Oli was <laughs> part of the show i curated at the museum of fine arts in leipzig that's where he met the now director of the museum museums in linz alfred weidinger and then alfred weidinger invited Oli to do a show in linz and then he put the show together with andrea emmerlein And there's been a couple of paintings by Ollie in the show, like for example, his one of his iconic self-portraits. And Ollie coined the term <clears throat> post-digital pop. It's sort of like I think it's sort of like the movement after mm. post post-internet art, maybe. Mm -hmm. I can say that. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to tell our views more about post-digital pop? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of layers here. I mean, talking with Ollie, the first thing you notice is he's an incredibly layered thinker as much as an artist. Um, he's incredibly articulate about his definition of post-digital pop. And that's why I think, you know, as, uh, well, I guess he was around 23 years old when he came up with the term. Um, mm. He really knew right off the bat, like exactly what sort of visual aesthetic he was conjuring and the kind of landscape Uh, both in like a, like visual, but also uh, economic terms, the sort of landscape, the art landscape he was entering into as an undergraduate. Um, I think, yeah, talking about Ali, I'll go on to the post-digital pop in a sec, but one thing that I also thought was really important was his role in the, the kind of core idea of the show, which is the making of online communities. Um, like from the get-go, Ali has always been super engaged with social media. Um, and that's one thing that I think is really important also to like uh, address when you talk about his work or when anyone talks about his work is like he's using Instagram as a kind of digital community, but his work isn't so much influenced by the aesthetics of Instagram as its social and political opportunities. Uh, it's opportunities to engage with other artists whose work he kind of finds a sort of synergy with as, as much of a space to connect with and engage with curators or collectors or audiences maybe that extend beyond like traditional white cube gallery spaces. So that's like a super important aspect of his practice. And I would, I would argue that his, his work is almost like, I mean, yeah, he's a painter, an incredibly talented painter, but also the kind of like sociology almost of digital art or online art communities that he's able to sort of network in and really like articulate the boundaries of is super amazing. Um, so I think you got to give him credit for that. But yeah, I mean, his, his, his idea of post digital pop is, a, is an interesting one and it's super zeitgeisty. It's super like relevant and immediate. Like when you look at one of his works, the kind of like the seamless uh, airbrush finish of his character, mm. the sort of like hyperbolic sexuality of many of the, the, the figures like the air hostess or um, 
let's say like I don't know the the really like voluptuous woman in the cheetah print like uh, g-string. There's just a lot of like it's kind of like bubbling over with this inherent sexuality, but it's also very aware. It's kind of calling this like catch twenty two with like commer it's like commercialization or it's like commercial aesthetic. Like, because on the one hand, it's super seductive and streamlined, and you see lots of like brand names, like Nike. You'll see like a Nike Swish or a Lacrosse Gator. Um, there's just a lot, or like yeah, like AirPods. You'll see a lot of that sort of like in-your-face marketing, almost like the language that like all of us like kids born in the '90s get like every day when we're just so used to there being this like influx of like marketing material thrown at us, like while navigating the internet. Um, so it's kind of like in a lot in a lot of ways it's like absorbing that like uh, super exposure, hyper exposure to commercial excess. Um, it's sort of reflecting a bit of it back in a way that it knows it's super seductive. The visual language is super seamless and seductive. But then it's also like there's the kind of element to his work that I, it's almost like tragic in a way because it, it like knows that it's caught in that sort of endless feedback loop um, of being like hyper commercial but also like hyper commercialized in a way and I think that Ollie like there's a level of criticality there and I think that's that's why he's been moving in a slightly different direction in his recent projects and his recent paintings like moving away from human figures like he just uh, debuted some, an amazing series of black swan paintings in Paris a few months back um, there's a kind of interest I think that he has in currently in like pushing past like human-centric concerns and thinking a bit more about like other creatures, other world, I guess. I think he's back to human. Oh yeah. Humans again, yeah. <laughs> he moves so fast, it's hard to keep track of him. <laughs> <laughs> he like never, he never touches that. Yeah, I mean, that's a cat, you know. Yeah, true, that's a cat. Yeah, that's a cat. <laughs> Um, yeah, great. I mean, speaking of Ollie, and you mentioned how important social media is, and that's how. Uh, no, I. And um, yeah, I think I've seen uh, uh, met Ollie online for the first time, or I stumbled mm. across his work, but then I've been to the Artissima Fair mm -hmm. uh, in Italy, and. Um, His gallery, yeah, the name of his gallery in Paris is Sam Yus, I think. Mm -hmm. And I've been at their booth and I was like struck by some of Ollie's, it's funny to say early paintings because like you <laughs> mentioned, he's very young and it's yeah. like early work. Yeah. It's like really funny. He's, uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I stood there for like five to ten minutes. five to ten minutes and was totally blown away and then I interviewed him for Monopole magazine and, and got to know him mm -hmm. uh, over the months and years um, mm -hmm. and yeah he's, he's super active online and he's really really good at promoting himself and his work online and I think that's that's quite important and mm -hmm. that's what I mm -hmm. also find find interesting that young artists are not ashamed of saying well this is my new piece I have a show here I have a show there because how how would people know that you have a show on view or yeah. promoting, like you mentioned, the work of other artists. But um, what I, this would be my last question for you. And it's a quite tricky one, I would say. <laughs> what always comes up, I mean, we've, we've spoken about Amalia Ullman. And then, you know, when, when people write or speak about Amalia Ullman's Instagram performance, excellence, excellences and perfections, um, um, it was always about follower numbers and so on. And then, you know, It got called the first Instagram masterpiece and was exhibited at Tate Modern, uh, at the Whitechapel Gallery, and so on and so on, a like really big institution. But what's, what always and still happens is she's being called an Instagram artist mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. social media artist. Mm -hmm. And do you find that term appropriate? I mean, when did we ever call people or artists who have a website like website artists? Or yeah, do you call a writer who writes emails or is on Twitter, mm -hmm. Twitter writer, you know what I mean? What, what do yeah. you think about that term? It's a quite tricky question, I know. Yeah, no, it's really tricky. I mean, I almost see the term Instagram artist as the like 2020 variation of the term net artist, 
uh, you know, like referring to artists who were active exclusively on the internet um, in the 90s and early 2000s. And it's an interesting kind of collapse, I think. And um, unfortunately for the artists of today who get termed, who get, who get called Instagram artists, I don't think it's really fair on them because when you look at net artists, like their entire practice was online and it was, it was, a, it was a kind of practice that you literally could not do anywhere else. Um, they were engaging in, you know, what was at the time the very limited technology of the web and they were exploring the social and cultural kind of connotations of this, this new, uh, virtual space to connect and engage with other people. So Instagram artists are doing that. They're using Instagram as a space to engage and connect with people that they wouldn't meet in real life. They're using it as a space to um, establish new, new connections with artists whose work they find interesting or artists who have a, a similar approach to their practice. Um, but I think that to call them Instagram artists misses the mark that their practices exist in many times, not always, but many times, exist also in other spheres. They exist in studio space, they exist in museums, they exist in group shows and apartments in Brooklyn. Um, they exist all over the place and they're messy, multi-dimensional, uh, multimedia artists. And I think to like, the, to reduce them to the idea of in, an Instagram artist is kind of denying, denying all of that. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really agree with it. And which, which term would you find more appropriate? I mean, I asked Amalia Ullman this question in an interview for Monopole magazine. I was like, well, do you like the term Instagram artist? Or I asked so many more artists and Then she was like, well, mm, I'm a net artist. And at some point she said, well, no, I'm simply an artist, you know. <laughs> I mean, I feel like with Amalia, like, yeah, like referring to herself as a net artist makes sense to me because the whole premise of that project existed exclusively on Instagram. Like it's inseparable from the medium that creates it. Mm. I think a way to acknowledge um, how social media impacts how an artist might present or speak about their practice, but shouldn't, um, you know, be considered this like all encompassing medium, which like defines the artist. I think, I think a way of describing that is like post social media artists. So it's like acknowledging the ways in which their practices have been influenced by social media, but it's not like, like, I don't know, like, Uh, lassoing them into the idea of just being an artist who makes content on social media and that's like literally their practice um i yeah. like that answer because that's a, that's a term i'm using a lot post social media yeah and i think ollie didn't agree on that mm -hmm. term what what did he want to you to use i can't remember Whew. uh but i remember geez, the that was a while ago perhaps you have a different perspective or a different connotation to a writer or a critic who kind of exists outside of that sphere, but um, wants to situate it in like an art historical context, let's say. Um, so yeah, I mean, I remember, I do remember that like little disagreement that we all have, but I think that it was a super interesting moment to kind of see it from Ollie's eyes in a way. Because, uh, like, if that's literally, like, your territory, maybe um, you, you wouldn't necessarily see it in the same way as a critic or a writer who's removed from that sort of, like, social circuit, in a sense, or has to take a step back in a way to write about it in a contextual or historical context. 